We're saved, everyone. Technological progress fixes yet another problem. And thank God, I thought I was going to have to give up consuming plastic. I mean, can you imagine? Bioplastics are really starting to catch on. We've got PLA cups made from corn. We've got compostable plastic straws now. Earlier this week, I got a package with these wood pulp-based plastic bags. That's genuinely awesome and definitely not worth any deeper investigation. Don't, don't look at that. All right, look. Compostable plastics are a great thing, no doubt about it. But we should talk about the potential risks and downsides if we're actually going to build a sustainable future. Today, we're taking a big picture look at bioplastics. We'll talk about what they are, how they're sourced, what challenges there are to processing them, and if the promise of compostability actually holds up to scrutiny. Biopolymers have actually been a thing for a long time. I'll remind you, first of all, that indigenous peoples around the world have been using natural rubber and latex sap, among other things, for thousands of years, long before colonizers came through, figured out rubber's value only when it could serve the purpose of industrialization through tire production, and enslaved a bunch of indigenous people to cheaply extract it, devastating local ecosystems in the process. Yeah, this is slide one. Get ready, folks. Similarly, shellac, a resin extracted from this female lac beetle, was used in India for thousands of years, but didn't make its way to Europe until about the 17th century. After that point, shellac resin, shellac dye, and shellac wax were used by painters both to create their art and to provide them with a protective coating. It also began to be used for finishing furniture, wood flooring, and other wood carvings. Also, again, vinyl records, but I already spent a whole lecture on that, so I won't belabor that point again. To shellac something or give it a shellacking is still old person speak for coating something in a polymer substance. Nowadays, of course, we have petroleum-based polymers like PVC instead, although it's worth noting the irony that switching from biopolymers to petrochemical-based plastics was meant to save nature. There were other early bioplastics like colloidin used for wound dressing and for older photography methods back before we all had iPhones. Some very nerdy photographers still actually use the wet colloidon method to make art to this day. Celluloid is attributed to Alexander Parks, hence the original name Parkson, and Maurice Lemoyne first isolated the first known bacteria-based bioplastic, PHB. Also, famously, Henry Ford produced some parts of his early cars using plastics made from soybean oil, but it was around the 1930s and 40s that we switched from primarily plant-based plastics to primarily petrochemicals because they were cheaper, and of course, to save nature. Let's see how that saving nature thing is going. Oh, right, untold amounts of horror and devastation. These are just a few of the high-profile events from 2023 so far, that can be attributed to fossil fuels. Fun fact that Groton fuel spill was only 10 miles or so from my parents' house. I'll be totally honest here, this lecture isn't going to paint the prettiest picture of bioplastics. However, as critical as we can be of bioplastics, there is an imperative to transition away from fossil fuels one way or another. And as a scientist who studies plastic, I am very, very glad that bioplastic alternatives exist, which can help divert money and resources away from big oil. That said, just as it's important for the consumer to know about which items are recyclable and which aren't, it's just as important for consumers to know about bioplastics' actual compostability, as well as which items are suited for which types of degradation. You've probably seen a lot of these new biodegradable plastics on the market, from these green striped cups to cutlery that claims to be compostable. What are these products made of, and how do they come to be? What are the challenges with bioplastic processing, and if there's a type of plastic that's biodegradable, why aren't we all using it? The first thing you need to understand is that bio-based plastic is an umbrella term that's thrown around to mean all sorts of different things, including polymers that have the exact same properties as fossil fuel-based plastics, including the quality of taking thousands of years to degrade, but which happen to be sourced from biomass instead of fossil fuels. 
These are often called drop-in materials, like bio-based polyethylene to replace normal polyethylene. But let's be clear, a polymer's properties, its density, melt strength, ability to degrade, etc., emerge from its structure. It's great that we have new sources for materials like PET and polyethylene that don't rely on the fossil fuel industry. But we have to look at a product's full life cycle. In terms of processing and end of life, it doesn't matter whether this particular carbon atom came from petrochemicals or if it came from a plant. The properties for these drop-in polymers will be the same. In other words, like Pam says, they're the same picture, at least from a material science perspective, following its initial raw material sourcing. Bio-based plastic may also be a marketing term used for anything that's made of at least a little bit, though not 100%, biologically sourced plastic. While there may have been advances in using totally plant-based alternatives like PEF in place of PET for bottles, some companies do greenwash their products as being bio-based when they don't in fact contain 100% bio-based materials. If you want to cut through the marketing mumbo jumbo, here is the simplest way to explain it. We can basically put all plastics on a two axis graph, bio-based and fossil fuel based versus degradable and non-degradable. In one corner, you have conventional plastics, non-biodegradable materials like PET, polyethylene, polypropylene, and more that are sourced from fossil fuels. This represents 99% of plastic products. Then you have bio-based drop-in materials like PET and PE and PP that happen to be sourced from plants, bacteria, algae, etc. You also have a very short list of plastics that are fossil fuel-based, but which happen to degrade quickly, like PBAT, the material used in some compostable plastic trash bags. And then you have the gold standard plastic, both biosourced and biodegradable. If anyone is ever confused about the state of bioplastics, just show them this plot because this is a really important distinction. That said, if you look at the current range of modern bioplastics, you can see that we're a bit all over the place in our approach. I personally put bioplastics into a few different categories, although this is not an exhaustive list. Category one is what I call durables and drop-ins, plastics that behave exactly like conventional plastics, but are either fossil fuel-based or easily biodegradable, but not both. These include non-biodegradable plastics that happen to be made from biomaterials like bio-PET, which is chemically the same as PET, and fossil fuel-based materials which happen to be degradable like PVA. PEF, polyethylene furanoate, is a rising competitor to PET for bottle applications, for example, because it's also bio-based. But because of its uncleavable aromatic rings, it's very non-degradable and thus only solves one of the problems with plastic. Category two are most often aliphatic polyesters, which are highly degradable thanks to the ester groups in their backbones, which can easily be cleaved by hydrolysis or enzymatic activity. That's science speak for these types of monomers are easy to cut apart and turn back into monomers. This is why PLA and PHA can degrade easily, but conventional plastics can't. These polymer chains can be broken apart very easily into short chains or even monomers that are, so far, considered environmentally safe. While in a perfect world, we would easily be able to reclaim these monomers once the chains are broken apart, this is still vastly better than mountains of plastic waste out in landfills and oceans. This list includes PLA, perhaps the most popular and versatile bioplastic on the market, which is derived from corn in here in the United States, or PHAs, a class of polyesters derived from bacteria and the material that makes up the marine degradable straws you can find in UMass's campus center. Category three are any naturally occurring biopolymers, and while these are useful and most easily extracted, we should also be skeptical of them. Cellulose, for example, is the most abundant natural biopolymer and is biodegradable. And yet regenerated cellulose, which is used to make semi-synthetic materials such as rayon textile fibers, constitutes 60% of seabed microplastics. Again, being biosourced doesn't mean that it's fully great at the end of its life. For perspective, here's the market landscape of European bioplastics in 2022. Clearly, the biggest use case for bioplastics are packaging material, both rigid and flexible, followed by clothing, while electronics and biomedical devices are much smaller. Also note the difference between these bio-based non-degradable plastics in blue and green 
and these fully biodegradable bioplastics in yellow and orange. While the fully biodegradable plastics have found some use in packaging material and consumer goods, they're still heavily competing with the non-biodegradable plastics. This all, of course, is utterly dwarfed by the fact that bioplastics only represent 1% of the total plastics market. This whole plot on the left here can fit into this tiny, tiny sliver of the big pie. So while it is imperative that we divest from fossil fuel-based plastic, it's also worth being mindful of what the impact of bio-based plastics might be if we keep consuming as much plastic as we currently are. Let's do a full life cycle analysis on bioplastics, starting with material sourcing, then going into polymer processing, which this class is definitely about, then end of life disposal and recycling. I won't cover transportation in depth for now. Let's assume this to be largely the same as it is for petrochemicals. And at least for now, let's hold off on use and the broader risks of human toxicity and environmental damage from microplastics. Starting with sourcing, bioplastics have to come from somewhere. And while the source of raw materials changes depending on what resources a country has available to them, in the US, we're talking about corn. Let's refresh ourselves on conventional based plastics for a sec. The key to regularly sourced polyethylene is the ethylene monomer, which can be created fairly easily using fossil fuels, specifically from ethane cracker plants, which dehydrate ethanol to form ethylene. But as we all know, fracking bad, fossil fuels bad, so what else is out there? The sourcing of bioplastics often involves the growing of plants, which produce sugars that are fermented to form bioethanol. The idea is that plants take carbon from the atmosphere and energy from the sun, which we can then harness in the form of our own carbon-based materials and as an energy source. After we get bioethanol, we can use it to make a variety of materials. For example, if we're making biopolyethylene, the rest of the process is exactly the same. Dehydrate it into ethylene, then polymerize it using ziegler natta catalysts. Or we can convert bioethanol into a number of other monomers, just like how we convert regular ethylene into vinyl chloride monomer through chlorination. Bioethanol is the key ingredient in most of these drop-in bioplastic materials, which again can come from a variety of sources. Across South America, bioethanol is sourced from sugarcane, and here in America, we're all about corn. Corn is also the most common source for PLA, the current poster child for bioplastics, although it can also be made from food waste. A process called wet milling converts corn starches into water, which is then fermented with lactobacillus bacteria to make lactic acid. The full process of material sourcing and polymerization takes 65% less energy than conventional plastics, and PLA has been used in everything from 3D printers to biomedical devices since the material is also biocompatible. That said, it's not all roses for bioplastic from a material sourcing perspective. That's because instead of being extracted from deep underground, all of these bioplastics rely on crops, which involves a lot of land and water use. So let's do some quick math. The total US cropland is about 166 million hectares. One hectare is about 2.5 acres. The cropland used to grow just corn in this country is 22% of that, about 37 million hectares. The amount of that corn that's used just to make bioethanol is 40% of that, about 15 million hectares. That means just about 8% of the total percentage of U.S. cropland is currently used to make bioethanol. Remember that most of this is used for fuel. Ethanol is added to gasoline to make it greener and explode less, which is great and as chemical reagents for other manufacturing sectors. Very little of that 8% is diverted to bioplastics. So what would it take to grow enough corn to convert all of our plastic packaging into corn-based, bioethanol-based plastic? Globally speaking, not just in the US, less than 1 million hectares is used to grow the materials needed for bioplastics. So just under 0.02% of global land goes to bioplastics. But a complete switchover of the 170 million tons of global packaging plastics produced per year to corn-based bioplastics has been estimated to require 54% of the current corn production and 60% more than Europe's annual freshwater withdrawal. So if we keep our current consumption levels the same, we would need to eat less food, less corn, or convert even more natural habitats to farmland, effectively doubling our farmland. 
we're already facing droughts from climate change and the loss of biodiversity globally, so this is a no-go from the jump. Fun fact, Brazil has actually already faced this exact problem. The increased demand for sugarcane-based ethanol over there in the past few years has already resulted in tons of deforestation and the loss of biodiversity. And that's just land use, never mind everything else. This 2020 study crunched the numbers and found that if you compare the production of bioplastics to fossil fuel-based plastics, they only reduce greenhouse gases slightly, while using tons more land and orders of magnitude more water to produce. Think about it. Growing crops requires tons of land, water, and even fossil fuels to operate the farm equipment. Other reports even claim that bioplastics use more greenhouse gases overall, and again, we're just talking about the production side. This is why bioplastics aren't a one-size-fits-all solution that can be implemented independently of other changes. In theory, the transition of farm equipment to renewable energy should be able to mitigate some of these problems, though not all of them. Also, this is why we need diverse solutions, not just to convert all plastics to corn-based plastic, but to use a variety of approaches to material sourcing like seaweed, wood pulp, algae, and bio-waste. Yes, that means what you think it means. Or carbon capture. Scientists were recently able to synthesize a polymer using carbon they captured from the air, which is pretty cool. Speaking of feeding two birds with one seed, the U.S. already has a food waste problem. We end up throwing away 40% of the food we grow, so if that could somehow be diverted into plastic production, perhaps we don't need all that new land for corn. My point is, all these systems are interlocking, and the solution to the plastics crisis isn't as simple as dropping in a different material. Now let's talk about polymer processing again, finally. This will just be a fun review of the different polymer processing techniques from this class, along with an explanation of how easy it is to retrofit bioplastics into them. Ideally, a new wonder material would come along that's sustainably sourced, degrades naturally, and can be swapped into the existing plastic production infrastructure. Just change out the nurdles for the new material and you're good. Let's see what we've been able to do so far. First off though, through simple casting, you can make your own bioplastic at home. There are tons of recipes for potato starch based plastic that you can make all by yourself with simple kitchen equipment. If you've got some finesse, you might even be able to make a small bag or a small wrap material with the tools you already have available in your home kitchen. Just be safe and wear gloves. Of course, us chemical engineer types need something a little more scalable than this. As you recall from this entire semester, polymers are usually processed when they're in their melt state, given that viscosity, melt strength, melt stiffness, and density, and more are functions of temperature, polymers need very specific properties and structures to be processed successfully. Bioplastics are no different. They have appropriate processing ranges, melt strengths, melt viscosities, and more. Often you'll see bioplastics combined in blends or with additives, fillers, etc. to max out their properties just like conventional plastics. This affects how bioplastics get processed into the wide variety of items we use today. The good news is that for some processing techniques, bioplastics are totally retrofitable into the existing plastic production infrastructure meaning we can take our conventional fossil fuel-based plastics out and replace them with bioplastics one-to-one. -one. But it's not always that simple, especially for processing methods that are more complex. Simple profile extrusion is possible for most commercial bioplastics, including sheet extrusion, flat film production, and more. You can very easily replace things like straws, films, bags, and other extruded parts with biodegradable options. The requirements of extrusion on the polymer aren't super stringent. All it needs to be able to do is melt and solidify relatively quickly. Some bioplastics require multiple layers to get the same barrier properties as traditional plastics, just increase the thickness, but that's more than doable. There are more experimental starch-based polymers being researched everywhere, and biodegradable bags and films are already everywhere on the market. This is perhaps the easiest type of product to recreate using new materials. And that's great because films and bags aren't typically recyclable through traditional recycling facilities since they can strangle sorting equipment. Thumbs up to compostable bags. Thermoforming is also a method that's easily compatible with bioplastics. Here, a plastic sheet made by extrusion is heated up and shaped using a combination of vacuum, applied pressure, or direct mechanical force. 
Everything you see on screen right now is a thermoformed PLA product, including these yogurt cups, these coffee pods, these clamshells, and these cups, of course, getting made right now. Another W for bioplastic. Injection molding is where things start to get a little bit tricky. This process uses a reciprocating screw to push molten plastic into a closed mold. Then once the plastic part is cooled, it's demolded using ejector pins. This is also how cutlery is made, with multiple spoons or forks being attached to the same set of runners and gates. Most compostable cutlery is made from PLA, but not many other bioplastics are capable of being used with this processing method because of their melt characteristics. Remember that unlike profile extrusion, which is much more scalable, this method requires very specific polymer properties at each stage of production. They need to be at the right melt state, the right viscosity, the right temperature, the right pressure, the right thickness, at all of these various stages. Leaving the extruder, entering the mold, filling all the intricacies of the mold cavity, cooling down in a short enough amount of time to keep production going, but not so quick that it solidifies in the mold too early, and demolding without issues. Most of the available bioplastics on the market right now have a hard time here, especially with their demolding behavior. Two of the biggest problems that bioplastic face in injection molding are part shrinkage and part sealing. Plastic, like many materials, shrinks as it cools. But because bioplastics seem to shrink way more than conventional plastics when cooling in the mold, this limits their ability to be retrofitted into existing molds. Also, it can take a much longer time for these parts to cool to a temperature where it's ready to demold. If processing time takes too long, or if a proper seal can't form between the mold halves, as you can see in these parting lines, then we can't produce as many parts as quickly as with conventional plastics. Depending on your industry, this might be a no-go. Blow molding is used to make basically hollow parts, most often bottles, and most often using injection molded preforms. We've already established that injection molding is difficult for bioplastics, although some alternatives to PET are on the market right now, albeit more expensive ones. This is also a process where the polymer has to have very specific properties at all stages of production, especially melt characteristics. After being heated by IR lamps, preforms need to be moldable by way of having air blown into them, but not molten to the point of turning into a goopy liquid, and yes, that is the scientific term. The material needs to maintain shape when melted in order to be blown, but too much stiffness during inflation can lead to stress cracks in the material. Unfortunately, most bioplastics out there right now struggle with this property. PLA does all right, but there hasn't been a fully degradable bioplastic that has just the right melt strength to be able to be blown quite like PET or polyethylene. This might change with time and technological development, but in the meantime, Drop-ins like bio-PET and biopolyethylene still take most of the bioplastic bottle market. Many bioplastics, PLA included, have another problem when it comes to making bottles, whose main application is obviously to store liquids. Most bioplastics are hydrophilic, meaning they absorb water, unlike polyethylene and polypropylene, which are hydrophobic and don't have this problem. This is a problem not just for its end use, but also for processing. For example, PLA needs to be kept dry at every stage of the production process, or else it could be susceptible to hydrolysis. Hydrolytic degradation produces lower quality parts and also limits their applicability in foaming applications, since foaming agents can produce ammonia and water in the form of steam. Starch-based bioplastics do foam very well, but they also degrade quickly upon exposure to moisture. One manufacturing solution to this could be to add drying steps at all stages of the process to prevent the accumulation of moisture, but that re requires significant investment, and some production facilities might have the floor space or electrical equipment needed, and besides, what if the product gets wet when it's being used? These properties make hydrophilic bioplastics like PLA a poor drop-in substitute for these kinds of applications. All of these reasons are why you see a lot of biodegradable plastic cups and bags and straws, but not a lot of bioplastic bottles, foam packaging, or intricate injection molded products. The material properties just don't make them easy to process. So we've talked about sourcing, we've talked about processing, now let's talk about the final stage in a plastic product's life cycle. The promise of biodegradable and compostable plastics 
is that we're supposed to be able to throw them in with our compost piles and forget about them. Or we can simply landfill them and they'll degrade faster, right? Let's take a closer look at that claim. For those unfamiliar with composting, it's a great way to get rid of food scraps without contributing to landfill waste. Living organisms in soil, like bacteria or worms, can break down food into usable nutrients, creating nutrient-rich soil that's great for planting and thereby reducing greenhouse gas emissions, conserving water, and reducing the amount of synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides needed to grow plants. You can start a compost bin in your own backyard, give your food scraps to a local farm or community garden, or contribute to a large-scale industrial composting site, which operate at much higher temperatures and moisture levels than anything you can make in your backyard. If you don't already compost, I suggest giving it a try. There are even apartment-friendly composting techniques like tiny buckets or the Bokashi method. What I do nowadays is I take my vegetable scraps and store them in the freezer until such a time when I could make them all into soup stock and then take those food scraps and then bring them to a compost site. If you plan on composting those PLA cups though, you should first check to see if your local composting site accepts plastic, because many places actually don't. Let's get into why. Polymer degradation is something that's worth understanding the mechanism for. Like I said in the first lecture, the only reason we know how long it takes for plastics to degrade in the environment is thanks to technologies like the UV chamber, where we put polymers under intense UV conditions and use math to approximate their lifetime when exposed to natural sunlight. We also study degradation under specific microbial environments like composting sites. But remember that the composting site in your backyard is fundamentally different from an industrial composting site. This is a really important distinction because when we hear that something is biodegradable, we might think that we could throw it anywhere, like in the middle of the woods, and that means it'll dissolve just fine. In reality, there's a big difference between biodegradation and composting. Biodegradation is slower, and in the realm of bioplastics, is incapable of truly breaking down degradable plastics into monomers. Instead, it leaves behind microplastics. Do not toss any bioplastics out into the middle of the woods, even if it says it's biodegradable. That's unfortunately misleading marketing, and it can contaminate the food chain. Composting, on the other hand, breaks down degradable plastics into non-toxic compounds like CO2 and water, and in the case of food, usable nutrients for soil. Remember that the difference between biodegradation and composting is a higher temperature, higher humidity, and the greater presence of microbial life. We might describe biodegradation as nature-controlled degradation, as in by bacteria and fungi, and composting as human-controlled degradation. In theory, composting is a great fit for something like bioplastic food packaging, which is often contaminated with food and is thus harder to recycle. Pizza boxes, for example, aren't recyclable because they're contaminated with all that pizza grease. It's important that we get this composting thing to work too, since landfilling bioplastics can often have a greater environmental impact than landfilling traditional plastics. If you weren't aware, when food waste biodegrades in the environment, it creates carbon dioxide. But in a landfill environment, particularly when food enters a landfill and then other trash is dumped on top of it, creating an anaerobic environment, methane gets produced instead of CO2. And methane is a greenhouse gas 30 to 80 times more potent than CO2. Bioplastics have the exact same problem. When they're landfilled rather than composted, they create methane. This is what tips it over the edge in terms of environmental impact in those pesky life cycle assessments. Bioplastics and traditional plastics were already neck and neck in terms of greenhouse emissions because of the sourcing thing, but because most bioplastics end up in a landfill, certain bioplastics are even worse for the planet than fossil fuel-based plastics. The good news is that composting these bioplastics when done correctly works. Bioplastics need very specific microbial or enzymatic environments to degrade properly, and that's exactly what a nutrient-rich composting environment provides. This 2018 study looked at several prominent bioplastics as well as bioplastic blends and found that industrial composting conditions were able to degrade them, at least in a controlled lab setting. Home composting and marine environments, on the other hand, led to mixed results, and that's because home composting doesn't get to those super high temperatures super high levels of moisture or high levels of microbial growth. Only polyhydroxybutyrate, 
PHB, which is sourced from bacteria, and thermoplastic starch, TPS, were able to degrade in all environments. Here's that same data plotted with composting on the right here and anaerobic digestion on the bottom. Anaerobic digestion is a slightly more industrial process and also produces high amounts of methane here in pink and here in blue, whereas composting is more achievable at the community scale. So that's what scientific publications mostly focus on. Most of the commercially available bioplastics were completely composted in under 80 days, which is the standard, though most bioplastic blends lasted a while. So, at least in theory, composting works, which makes all the previous efforts at least somewhat worth it. The trouble comes when we translate from the laboratory to reality. Most bioplastics are incompatible with home composting, which is already a non-starter since that's how the vast majority of users will end up using them to nourish their home soil. And even industrial composting sites have trouble degrading these supposedly degradable plastics since they have a net negative effect on the soil. That's because unlike food scraps, which are rich with nutrients that bacteria love to eat up and turn into nitrogen for our soil, bioplastics don't actually contribute any nutrients to composting environments. If you were to start composting at home and you only threw in bioplastics, they would never degrade because the microbes would have no food. To actually degrade these bioplastics in practice, you need to add tons of food and tons of water to account for the plastics. This is to say nothing of how many plastics, including bioplastics, contain additives like plasticizers and pigments, just like conventional plastics, which contaminate the compost and lower its overall quality even more. It's also ridiculously easy for consumers to confuse compostable plastics with regular plastics. And remember, if these plastics don't degrade properly, they release tons of methane, just like in a landfill. All of these problems are why many composting facilities, including those across the entire state of Oregon, don't accept bioplastics right now. They usually don't degrade properly, require tons of extra food and water usage, and they contaminate the soil with additives, PFAS chemicals, and even regular plastics when consumers get confused. All of this increases operational costs while driving down the quality of the resulting compost and hurting its resale quality, since organic farmers don't want their soil contaminated with microplastics and the average home buyer doesn't want to mysteriously find a piece of a plastic fork in their garden one day. I would also be missing an opportunity if I didn't rant about PVA and PMMA for a little bit. PVA is a fossil fuel-based plastic that's in Tide Pods, laundry sheets, and those little water pellet guns you're probably seeing advertised on YouTube and TikTok. These are sold to us as biodegradable plastics, and while they do dissolve in water, these also need very specific microbial conditions to degrade into their monomer counterparts, and those aren't met by your lawn or your washing machine. Companies like Procter & Gamble love to market their products as biodegradable, despite the fact that if you use these products as intended, they will never degrade, and in the case of Tide Pods specifically, 75% of the plastic ends up in our waterways as microplastics. Kind of like how dissolving salt in water makes it visually disappear, but it doesn't actually go away. It becomes salty water. Dissolving PVA detergent pods or laundry sheets into your water makes it plasticky water. And once that water goes down the drain, what should happen is that the wastewater treatment plants use tertiary water recycling to remove the microplastics from the water. Unfortunately, not all wastewater treatment plants have tertiary recycling, only primary and secondary recycling, which is why over 65% of PVA released from wastewater treatment plants is released into our waterways or soil. Much of this also applies to PMMA and other plastics that are marketed as biodegradable. You really can't trust packaging when it says biodegradable, unfortunately. All of this is why bioplastics do pretty poorly in life cycle assessments. They need more land, more water, and energy to synthesize the nurdles than conventional plastic. They require even more processing know-how and additives to process the parts, and they have massive end-of-life problems that cause them to have a huge greenhouse gas emission problem. They can also emit microplastics over their lifespan as covered in this systematic review of bioplastic toxicity, which I encourage you to check out if you get the chance and want to learn more about materials like PLA. Bioplastics are not a panacea for the plastics crisis. 
We should definitely be doing more research into them. In fact, as we transition to renewables for farming or solve other societal problems like widespread food waste, it will start to make a bit more sense agriculturally to start growing food to make bioplastics. Also, we need investment in composting infrastructure, corporate accountability, and education to make sure consumers know how to dispose of their plastics, bio-based or not. If we do all of those things, then the tides might change for bioplastics. For now, compostable plastics are good for some applications, but definitely not as a replacement for all food packaging globally. We need to not be tricked by promises of sustainability and instead look at a product's full life cycle before concluding that it's a suitable replacement for existing technology. I want to make another point about life cycle assessment, especially to those who are new to the practice. It's incredibly easy to fall into the trap of analysis paralysis to slide down a rabbit hole of, well, this uses more water, but this uses more carbon. The plastic industry loves to make claims like, oh, well, those cotton tote bags use 150 times more water than a plastic bag, so you need to use them 150 times to justify their existence. As though I haven't been using the same two reusable grocery bags every week for the past six years. Or how about these? If you were to replace all packaging with corn, it would need this much land use. If you were to replace all packaging with seaweed, it would do this to the ocean habitat. If you are to re replace all packaging with potato starch, this bad thing would happen, so on and so forth. But here's the thing. We don't actually have to use just corn or just potatoes or just algae or just seaweed to replace all plastics because we have corn and potatoes and seaweed and algae and all of these other tools at our disposal. Diversity is our strength. There's an infrastructural argument to be made here too. Why make our whole economy run on corn when corn is only grown in a handful of states? Maybe states near the ocean can make seaweed-based stuff while states in the Midwest can make corn-based stuff and we can trade as needed. There will never be one wonder material that replaces everything, one panacea for the entire plastic pollution problem, but we have all of these different tools and we can and must diversify. Also, while most of this lecture involved consumer goods, rigid packaging, flexible packaging, and food service wear, there are also plenty of other applications for bioplastics that are far more defensible. Agricultural films, flower pots, seed packets, and other types of plastic used in farming can be designed for biodegradation, and the processing of these types of materials should for sure be studied. And for when we one day return to the earth, medical devices and implants, a comparatively smaller market, are a great place for bioplastics, particularly biocompatible wound dressings and implants, guided tissue regeneration membranes, bandages, air filters, and maybe even N95 masks can all be made with high quality medical grade bioplastics. And many of these are already on the market. You can get surgical sutures made of PLA, starch based scaffolds for tissue engineering and more. And not to get too personal once again, just kidding, it's already too late for that. But I'm a deaf positive person, and I want my body to be composted one day after I pass away. And I don't want any plastic bits contaminating the soil when I go into the ground, although perhaps I don't get much choice in that. We can talk ourselves in circles about critiquing science, critiquing the plastics industry, but at some point we have to put on our lab coats and get to work. I'm sure you all took this class because you are looking for answers about the best plastics to use in everyday life, or how to make the best plastics in your careers. One simple answer is just to do a little bit better every day. Consider a product's full life cycle before committing to it, including the current recycling and composting infrastructure. Just because something is recyclable in theory or compostable in a lab setting doesn't mean that those are true in practice in the real world. And remember, there are many creative solutions everywhere, including this brand new flower-based cutlery that contains no PFAS, no additives, no toxic anything whatsoever, and dissolves in water within 60 days. It'll probably cost more. In fact, these definitely cost more, but it's all worth it to save the planet, right? Nature gives us so many gifts. Plastic was one of those gifts. We just got greedy and we took too much. The next great material can come from anywhere as long as we look hard enough. Lastly, remember the processing perspective. Conventional plastic didn't emerge from the earth fully ready to make into forks and phone cases. It took decades of research and development to get the technology to where it is now. Bioplastics need that time too. 
We can research new materials, new processing methods, and new ways to add bio-based fillers into bioplastics to make compostable composites. Like my Pila phone case, which is 100% compostable and protects my phone just fine. Plastics are a decades-old technology, so expecting bioplastics to be immediately perfect from the jump without the need for tons of research or additives is just unrealistic. We just need to be patient, and the right tech will come along. Is what I would say if I was a rube. I mean, just think about this for a second. We want to grow food, not for eating, but just to turn it into plastic? Doesn't that sound backward? At the most extreme, even some scientists want to breed flies just to turn them into plastic. Isn't this right back where we started with rubber barons and abusing bug life? Is this what innovation looks like? Are we really stuck with innovating new ways to kill and maim nature so that we can have our to-go salads? Can we really truly imagine no future where we're not killing the planet in order to make more plastic? Besides, do you really think the plastic industry is just gonna let us get away with replacing their technology with some freaking seaweed? Oh, and don't forget, most of these bioplastics are absolutely drenched in PFAS chemicals. Oh yeah, it's time. We are finally talking about... I used to be a slave to scraping and scrubbing pots and pans, but I've been liberated by Teflon. Food doesn't stick to Teflon like it does to other things. See? And because food doesn't stick to Teflon, it's easier to clean. And that makes my life a lot easier. Teflon is so much easier to clean. It's a clean winner. Tell your friends. Teflon, the clean winner from DuPont. PERT and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS chemicals, are a class of chemicals consisting of fluorinated chains. The addition of fluorine to a polymer generally makes the surface of a polymer part non-stick and impermeable to both water and oil. PFAS can be considered long chain, eight or more carbon atoms, or short chain, seven carbon atoms or fewer, and the shorter versions are considered more harmful by toxicology experts. But less harmful by the plastics industry because they're supposedly less likely to fall off of plastic products, which who knows if that's even true in practice. The most popular of these are PFOA and PFOS, but there are more than 14,000 substitutes for PFOA and PFOS that basically function the same but have slightly different chain lengths and functional groups. For our purposes, it's worth treating them as a class of chemicals. As I said, these fluorinated chains are often found attached to a polymer backbone as functional groups. They make up the coatings of nonstick pans and the coatings of lots of different forms of food packaging to serve as a barrier to both oil and water, but also polyester fibers to make them waterproof, pizza boxes to make them greaseproof, and plenty of other surfaces that, to someone 100 years ago, would seem like magic. In fact, plenty more materials contain PFAS today than you might think. Rain jackets, microwave popcorn bags, firefighting foam, makeup, floss, and other things that go in or around your mouth all have these super cool cancer-causing ingredients. Most notably for today's class, many of the compostable alternatives to packaging, including the ones seemingly made of paper, contain PFAS chemicals to make them more oil-proof and less permeable. Chipotle and Sweetgreen got cooked, pun intended, for using these containers a couple of years back, not because these two companies are particularly evil compared to others, but because they were early adopters of this technology and touted the environmental friendliness of their new compostable packaging the loudest out of anyone. In reality, when you compost such containers, even in an industrial setting, these PFAS chemicals get into the soil and thus into our environment and food chains. By the way, if you're in the grocery store looking for disposable plates, go for the ones specifically labeled PFAS-free. These are luckily far more available than they were just a couple of years ago, so please go do that if you can. PFAS has very much entered our water supply, so much that you don't even need to drink water that comes in a plastic bottle to get hit with PFAS anymore. Aluminum cans and glass bottles of sparkling water all contain varying amounts of PFAS in them, so avoiding this with our individual actions, while important to try, is a little out of our hands. Come on, 
That's because so much more so than consumer goods, PFAS enter our waterways and food systems through industrial pollution, much like how nurdles contribute more to plastic pollution than individual straw use. The oil industry also uses PFAS chemicals in fracking. Over the last decade, oil and gas companies have pumped at least 43,000 pounds of PFAS into more than 1,000 fracked oil and gas wells in Texas alone, which brings this whole thing full circle putting polymers deep underground to make more polymers. Also, PFAS are regularly used as mold release for compression molding, injection molding, and blow molding, or as lubricants for extrusion, thermoforming, and pretty much everything else. In 1983, the FDA approved the use of fluorinated gas to treat polyethylene food containers like plastic bottles, deli containers, and clamshell packaging, which essentially performs the same function as PFAS replacing hydrogen atoms on the surface of plastic with fluorine atoms, creating a barrier between the plastic and the liquid being stored. The FDA allowed for up to 5,000 parts per billion of total fluorine in the container, which is several orders of magnitude higher than what the EPA considers a safe level for PFOA or PFAS, those being 0.004 and 0.02 parts per trillion, respectively. In other words, the health advisory for PFOA starts at four parts per quadrillion, but food containers are allowed to have 1.25 billion times that amount. I just want to say up front for the rest of this lecture, I am not a toxicologist, and I want to encourage all of you to go back to last week's reading from Sasha Adkins, who gave me some of her slides, a few of which you'll see parts of now. I'm going to speed run this stuff because this is slightly outside my area of expertise, I'm just reporting to you what I've heard from experts in the field. What makes PFAS so damaging, even at doses in the parts per trillion, is that they disrupt our endocrine systems, which are notoriously finicky. Most hormone-based drugs deliver doses as low as a few parts per billion, because that's all they need to do. PFAS chemicals do their damage by attaching themselves to the hormone receptors in our bodies, meaning that instead of the parts of our bodies getting delivered the correct hormones we need at the correct stage of bodily development, our bodies get tricked into performing the functions associated with those hormones, usually far sooner than necessary. The saying that the dose makes the poison dates back to this old dead guy named Paracelsus, who originally said it in German, which I will not attempt to repeat here. But endocrine systems show us that this isn't always the case. Certain chemicals can be harmful at really, really low doses, but not high doses or at low and high doses, but not moderate doses. PFAS have been linked to altered immune system and thyroid function, liver disease, lipid and insulin dysregulation, kidney disease, birth defects, autoimmune disease, as well as kidney, liver, and testicular cancer. And they can do all of that at doses as low as a few parts per trillion. Just going over a couple of the most harmful effects here, and I'm sorry, but we're going to have to talk about sperm. I'll just read from this article directly with a big transgender asterisk that not all the people who produce sperm self-identify as men. Working with a team of researchers in the United States, Brazil, Denmark, Israel, and Spain, Levine screened and brought together the findings of 185 sperm count studies from 1973 to 2011, and then conducted a so-called meta-regression analysis. The results, published in the journal Human Reproduction Update, showed a 52.4% decline in sperm concentration and a 59.3% decline in total sperm count among North American, European, Australian, and New Zealand men. The former measures in concentration of semen in man's ejaculation, while the latter is semen concentration multiplied by volume. In contrast, no significant decline was seen in South America, Asia, and Africa. The researchers noted, however, that far fewer studies have been conducted in these regions. Short version, PFAS lower your sperm count. PFAS and other endocrine disrupting chemicals have also been proposed as a contributing factor to earlier puberty in females, as well as obesity and a lower resting metabolism. This isn't to make the fat phobic mistake of saying that being fat is somehow wrong or immoral, but simply to use one if imperfect indicator to point our attention in the direction of the fact that these outside pollutants are disrupting human health. And while not directly attributed to PFAS, phthalates, an additive used in plastic production to make them more durable and pliable during processing, 
are also endocrine disrupting chemicals and have been linked to premature breast growth, including this unique case of a 23 month old Puerto Rican girl with premature breast development. This is an environmental justice issue too, with black girls experiencing an even earlier puberty over time than white girls. Puberty is starting younger now, and this is incredibly alarming. And it's not just humans, of course, the chemicals found in plastic are affecting animal life, marine life, plant life, and everything else. It was even found that pets living near the Chemours plant have a much higher concentration of PFAS in their blood than is considered safe by the EPA, which is 70 parts per trillion. This problem is not going away unless the people act against it. In fact, the plastic industry is still growing every year and had a huge boom during COVID. They aren't slowing down and perhaps it's even accelerating, much in the same way that global warming is causing people to use their air conditioners more, which is then contributing to global warming via electricity use and CFC use. Communities in California in response to droughts are encouraging homeowners to replace grass lawns with artificial turf, which contain PFAS and are ridiculously toxic. A far better solution to this particular problem would be to plant native plants instead of having a well-cut grass lawn, but that's another talk. The average consumer receives chronically low doses of PFAS throughout the daily purchases of things like grocery items and makeup, but let's not forget that the people most exposed to PFAS chemicals are workers. From the firefighters who use firefighting foam, to the people working on the factory floors making the plastic products we use every day. The people who get to choose profit over human health don't have to work on these factory floors. Working class people do, and disproportionately, women and people of color do. And bioplastics are not a savior either. Most contain thousands of chemical features that can present themselves as toxic to humans, especially ones made out of materials that people can be allergic to, like we talked about in our eco-ableism lecture with corn-based straws. And of course, PFAS. No matter how you look at it, plastics have been and always will be bad for the environment and bad for life, no matter how they're sourced, how they're processed, or how they're disposed of. I highly recommend that you peruse these resources on screen to educate yourself about toxicology and human development. These can be especially helpful for your class project, wink, wink, hint, hint, to determine which of the chemicals used in the manufacturing of plastics could present the biggest risks to human health. These are not easy issues to discuss. They affect all of us, and I understand if you're going through a little bit of heartbreak right now. That's okay, I've faced that heartbreak too. These phenomena are as difficult to mentally process as they are to study, since they defy everything we know about pollution. Max LeBron actually makes an astute observation that plastics might be just what society needs to shatter the myth of threshold theories of pollution. Consider the readings from last week. Rats poisoned by BPA have their reproductive health affected across three generations. The entire idea of transgenerational epigenetic inheritance from Sasha Atkins article Isolating the cause of early onset puberty, obesity, or other health impacts to just one hormone or one hormone disruptor is nigh impossible. And our current means of legislating PFAS chemicals are to do so one at a time, stopping PFOA, then stopping PFOS, then another, but only after we've proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're harmful. We don't have time to litigate 14,000 different individual chemicals one after the other. There is no safe dose of any of these PFAS chemicals in our systems, and we need to ban them as a class instead of asking how much is permissible to pollute. Here's where non-Western science comes into play once again. Not only does this idea of threshold pollutant run counter to indigenous ways of knowing, but this new scientific idea of transgenerational epigenetic inheritance affirms what marginalized people have already known for a long time. Kathleen Crocker says it best right here. Our history is neither written nor coded into our DNA, but is nevertheless scrawled and carved into us like graffiti. Some things fade quickly, but other events last longer or are temporarily obscured only to resurface generations later, powerful beyond what we have been taught to expect. Biologists used to have a comfortable dogma. We believe that everything about an organism can be found somewhere in its DNA. That is not wrong, but neither is it the whole story. Now I am here in the natural sciences building, having discovered a new function of hormones in crickets. 
What I, an indigenous woman and a scientist in defiance of every obstacle, have found is not limited to crickets. Researchers studying humans have found that our hormones too transcend generations and genes. What I have found may be new to biologists, but not to the peoples of what settlers call the new world. We have known for hundreds of generations that we carry our histories within us. They are a part of who we are. Hopefully by now you're seeing what has to be done to stop the plastics crisis. We can't just buy our way out. We need collective action to regulate the plastics industry. And perhaps more importantly, we need new philosophies. Plastic took over the world specifically because it was marketed as being cheaper, more lightweight, more durable, and totally convenient with no downsides. So when you're being sold a solution that's cheaper, more lightweight, more durable, and totally convenient with no downsides, it's worth having a healthy amount of skepticism. New technology is great. I'm very glad we have new emerging compostable plastics on the market, but it's not enough. We can't wait for some new technology to be developed. We can't wait for some magic bug to come eat our plastic for us. We need to fundamentally change how we view the world, what counts as pollution, how plastic is entangled in our daily lives, and what solutions we allow ourselves to imagine. So go buy a reusable straw, learn how to use a 3D printer so you can make only one gizmo that you need instead of supporting an industry that pumps out 10,000 gizmos a minute for most of them to go to landfill. Go buy a reverse osmosis filter for your home to remove the PFAS from your drinking water. Start composting your food scraps. But real change doesn't happen when just one person starts composting. Real change happens when a couple of people decide to start composting together. And then together you realize that it would be cool if your entire apartment complex had collective food waste sites. And then you realize that because there's this obscure town ordinance that prevents that from happening, so you petition to get that ordinance lifted, and then you win, which generates local media buzz. And now your whole town is composting too. If there's anything I've learned from community activism, it's that most great things start out as just five people talking in a living room. So go forth, use what I've taught you to make change wherever you are with whatever allies you can find. I can't wait to see what you do.